so <laughs> this is the one I don't want to share. It's so it's so 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 embarrassing. Hello, landing crew, and welcome to today's video. It's been a while since I've sat down. We we have to have a diet Pepsi. It's gonna be a long video. Hmm. All right. So today's video is gonna be about my autism results and my neuropsych results. Like a lot of it, a lot of it is going to be kind of centered around my autism results because even when they did the assessments, like even if they weren't trying to tie it into my autism diagnosis, it tied into my autism diagnosis. This is the second to last video in our autism series. As I said before, just comment any questions you have below and then I will do a final Q&A next week that you guys will get to watch. There is a segment to this that is mental health as well. I think that it's very important to raise awareness on mental health and kind of end the stigma, but I won't lie, the, these, these are some tough, tough videos to make because I'm being very vulnerable. In a world that wants everyone to look and act perfect and like nothing's going on behind the scenes, to kind of pull back that curtain on my life and be like, this is what I go through, this is what I'm dealing with, that's really, really, really hard, but I also feel like I have a platform, so let's do it. So first and foremost, we're just going to talk about the assessments that were done, and then I'll go into each assessment. I'm going to try making this video not super boring and me just reading off what they say kind of thing. I had what is called a neuropsych evaluation, which goes over more than just autism. So I was diagnosed with ADHD when I was like five or six. I was diagnosed with bipolar when I was 25. There were just a lot of things. So we just wanted kind of a conclusive answer on what exactly is going on with me. Because I feel like even if you're not on the spectrum, I feel like these evaluations are so, so helpful because they're able to help you see yourself in a different light. And once I had this evaluation, once I started to really dig down and understand myself a lot more, it has helped me in such a big way. The testing that they used was a clinical interview um, where they just sit down, a record it review, sensory inventory, which was like um, a checklist. So I just went through and I, I knew ahead of time I had sensory issues. And then they use the ADOS-2, which is the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule 2. Some of you guys might be familiar with this because it's one that's done on your child. Obviously, if it's a different module, mine was module four for adults. And the other one was the Autism Diagnosis Interview Revised, the ADIR. I'm not gonna go over my history because some of it's really personal and it's, it's not very interesting in my opinion. The behavior observations, I'll put it up on the screen. It says Stephanie was cooper cooperative and put appropriate effort. She displayed conversational gestures but had inconsistent <laughs> eye contact. I don't realize I do this, but sometimes when I'm trying to talk to someone, I won't keep their eye contact, I'll look away. I never realized I did that. <laughs> this is so embarrassing to read. <laughs> Stephanie overshared information about herself and had difficulty participating in reciprocal conversation. I do struggle with this. She also inter interrupted at times. This is a big issue I have is interrupting. And like when Lonnie and I are talking, I have to tell myself like, let him finish, let him finish, let him finish. Sometimes how I have to edit it, it does seem like I'm constantly interrupting him. But in that instance, it's not as much just because Lonnie and I are both ramblers. So I have to just kind of make it more, more presentable for an edited video, but I do interrupt him. I do try working on it. Stephanie had a slight stutter and her voice was loud. She used congruent facial expressions and was able to identify motions in others. Stephanie had limited insight into social relationships and struggled to articulate her own emotions. She was creative and she talked some about her special interests. <laughs> I'm a laugher. I laugh about everything, so I don't think that this is it, I mean, it is a little bit humorous because it's really embarrassing, but like when I'm really like embarrassed about stuff or nervous, like I laugh. So I may be laughing a lot throughout this video. So the rest is really boring and I'm not going to make you guys sit through that, but it's saying the ADOS and ADIR that I met the requirement for an autism diagnosis basically. So they actually break up the IDR and I am gonna show this on the screen just so you guys can understand. So reciprocal social interaction, my score was 13, you have to have a 10 to be diagnosed on the spectrum. Communication, I got a 12, <laughs> you have to get an eight. Uh, restricted repetitive stereotype behaviors, I got a four, uh, the cutoff is a three. 
in early abnormal development. I got a two, the cutoff was one. Now with all of this, they took into consideration my mom's developmental interview. On the other video, I kind of explained this, that that my mom underreported a lot. And for a little bit, I was kind of worried how that was going to affect my scoring and everything like that. But even with my mom underreporting, I met the cutoff. It's really important for there to be abnormal early development because then that shows that it's present from early childhood and not something that you are developing later in life because some of the traits of autism can mirror many many other things that's why I encourage everyone if you have availability I know not everyone has access to a clinic or to an evaluation but if you can I urge everyone to do it because sometimes we think we have XYZ, but it's something else. For example, I thought I had ADHD my entire life, like literally my entire life, and come to find out it's actually PTSD. So it's so important to, to let the professionals do what they do. If you can, I understand again, not everyone has access to it. There is another one in here that they did the SRS2, the Social Response Skills Second Edition. So they did that, they did the Vineln, the Speech Sounds Perception Test, Seashore Rhythm Test, Adult ADHD Self Report, my SRS total score was 126. And I think with this one, like the cutoff was like 69 or something like that. So I got almost double. And they're all severe except for my social motivation, which I don't even know what that means. But the rest, you guys can read through it. It's awareness, cognition, communication, motivation, restricted interests and repetitive behaviors. <laughs> definitely severe on that. Social communication and interaction, I definitely met the criteria in that instance. So <laughs> this is the one I don't want to share. It's so, it's so, so, so embarrassing. So this is basically the violin. If you don't know what the violin is, it basically tests adaptive skills. So all the kids have this one done too. And it basically shows your, your day-to-day -day skills activity. Lex, his IQ is higher. It's it's on the higher range, but like his day-to-day -day skills, he isn't able to do as much. So it brings his score all together and it kind of goes hand in hand because there is way more <laughs> to an autistic or any individual than IQ. You can be book smart, you can have the IQ, you can be good in academics and struggle in so many other areas. I have always been extremely high in academics. I always caught on very quickly. I test well, I always got good grades, but that doesn't mean I functioned like I should have on a regular basis. I struggled with a lot, as you guys are, are about, to, about to find out. They interviewed Lonnie for this part. So this isn't things that I told them. These are things that Lonnie reported to them. It's just because it's kind of hard as a person. Like you you don't want to admit that you struggle with hygiene. You, you don't want to admit that you struggle with cleaning up after yourself. So I think you always get a more accurate an accurate assessment if someone else does it for you. So it's broken up into three areas communication, daily living skills, and socialization. Socialization, I scored extensively low on. I really suck with socializing, okay? So if you guys have ever heard me say that I, it's taken me a really long time to find myself in friendships and things like this, this is why. Like my social skills and my friendship skills, they have definitely improved, but through the years, I really, really, really struggled with this so much. So communication and daily living skills, I got 76 and 71. So still, still low though. Overall, my score was 68. <laughs> That's all folks. I'm not gonna read the whole thing. The speech sounds perception, I, I did fine and there were no issues. The seashore rhythm, I didn't though. Basically, they had me listen to like tonal patterns and things like that and basically she said, her score of 24 shows some markers for auditory processing deficiency. I've talked about that, how I mispronounce words. The reason I do that is this, because I hear it said differently. So how I say things is how I hear it and that's why I don't say things correctly. The ADHD was a self-reported thing that I did and of course I was highly consistent with ADHD, but with PTSD, it's a little bit different. I always said I would never do a video about my PTSD, but I wouldn't mind doing a video about PTSD and just kind of explain like how it can affect people in day-to-day -day tasks. But basically when PTSD happens from a young age, your, your brain is still forming. And a lot of people don't realize this. So that's why if you hear me say like in live streams or something like my ADHD, it's because that's so much easier to explain. And it's like, I have all the traits of ADHD, but the source of it is something completely different. This is when we get into the mental health stuff. Was on the MCMI3, which was like 175 question assessment. And basically it rated me 
within the clinical range for avoidant and dependent personality patterns. And we are going to talk about that at the end. That's gonna be at the very end because it's not really as much to do with autism. So if you just came for the autism piece, you, you can leave, but it gets very, very complicated. Okay, so this is for those who are asking about the ADHD because that's a common thing. It says here, her history of trauma and her scores on the PCL5 support a diagnosis of PTSD. While Stephanie showed some problems with auditory pro processing, and reported substantial symptoms associated with ADHD, her symptoms can be better explained by PTSD as there is a natural overlap of PTSD and ADHD, just for those who don't know. I'm gonna talk about the other, like the mental health side of it, but basically I was diagnosed, medically diagnosed with autism primary, PTSD complex secondary, and then generalized anxiety disorder. And then underneath that, I have like insomnia, all of like my, my, like my medical stuff. So everything else like the dependent personality disorder and all of that, I don't have enough traits to be like clinically diagnosed with it, but that doesn't mean I'm not affected by it, if that makes sense. So I didn't even know that this was a thing. And once I learned this, it was like, life, it was life changing. So I'm sharing it to others out there. Basically avoidant personality disorder is basically where you're just don't like being social. You like avoid it. Some of these things like overlap or kind of just a part of autism. The dependent personality disorder is the one that made me go, whoa. I'm literally just speaking about myself and I'm not trying to make this about anyone. I'm not trying to like push blame. This is just me talking about who I am. But for a really, really, really long time, um, I would basically find friends that needed help or needed to be fixed in some way. What's hard is that when you have people that are already kind of broken in a way, they themselves have codependent issues. So when you have a dependent person and a codependent person together, it's a horrible combination. And I never really realized what that's what I was doing until I started to make friends that were healthy and didn't need fixing. I was just like, okay, this is a lot easier. Like this isn't as hard. So basically with dependent personality disorder, you you have this fear of being alone. So if you find people that have to depend on you, it, it ensures that you'll never be alone because they'll always have to depend on you. And it's this really, really weird toxic cycle. And and then also fear of abandonment, which makes sense. And then oversensitivity to criticism, which I've had to work very hard on that. I'm automatically, when someone gives me me criticism, whether it's constructive or it's not, I still automatically go into defensive mode. So I've had to work on that. A lot of these things, I have had to work so hard through the years not to do this, to acknowledge that it is not my job to fix other people. It is just as great to find people who don't need to depend on me, if that makes sense. And these are things that I did not do intentionally. I didn't seek people out thinking, oh, that person over there, they look like they, they need a lot of help. They'll have to depend on me forever. Let's do that. No, that never happened. It's just sometimes we automatically are drawn to certain situations and certain people because of our own trauma and because of our own issues. And that's just kind of how it works. And we never put a name to it and we never know. Kind of like how I lived 34 years of my life being autistic, having all these autistic tendencies, but not realizing that that's what was going on. So it's it's the same thing. It's the same mindset. It's something that, again, I've had to work really hard on. It's why it took me such a long time to be able to put up with boundaries with friends and such, because I was just like, if I do, what if they leave me? And it's just this toxic, toxic way of thinking. But I'm proud to say that I've worked so hard to get past it for the most part. I feel like we always have room for improvement. I will always have room for improvement. I will never say that I don't ever need to change anything about myself because that would be a lot. Okay, that is all folks. <laughs> um, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope it was informative and helped others out there. And it's hard to share these things because I feel like every time I share a little bit about myself, someone uses that later to use against me in a way. Again, leave any questions below as I will go through each video that I've done in this autism series and choose the really, really, really good ones. So leave your comments below and I will answer them on the next, next video. And we will see you guys tomorrow. Where you move, make me blind. You will always be there. There's no doubt in my mind. You will always be there. Heading out.
to see ya and leave